the Language Center, uh, Mrs. McKay, for the kind invitation to speak today. I think this is the first opportunity that I have to talk about my research at the Technical University. So I will tell you about my work in hearing, as I was at the Deafness Institute. And the title, which can luckily not be seen very well, Better Bus, Keep the Subwoofer, Hacker Hearing, is not something that I thought about. It was um, a description that was given to our research by a science magazine, uh, which I thought was uh, very catchy as a title, so I decided to use it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about bass, I'm not going to talk about subwoofers, I'm not talk going to talk about hacking today, but I am going to talk about hearing. So, in short, I'm going to tell you about the organ of hearing, which is the cochlea. I'm going to uh, make a brief introduction to sound, inner ear anatomy, and then I'm going to show you how we applied mathematics to study hearing in the ear. So, let's look at the... Oh, use that. Our ear. Uh, we all see the outside of the ear, uh, the tina and the ear canal, and sounds are collected in the ear canal and make the tympanic membrane move. The tympanic membrane then relays these oscillations to three small bones that are right be, uh, behind it, and the um, vibration is then relayed to the vestibular apparatus and the sparacochlea. The cochlea is where the mechanical signal, the sound is a mechanical signal, the mechanical signal is turned into a, a neural signal. And um, the cochlea has this characteristic spiral shape and it is embedded in the temporal bone, so it is somewhere here in our skull. Okay, so this is where all the magic happens. <laughs> and um, you, I should use that. The spiral shape of the cochlea is not unique to humans. All mammals have spiral cochleas. And this is the spiral cochlea and the three semicircular canals of a human from an MRI image. And this is the cochlea of a guinea pig. Here you see the spiral cochlea of a blue whale and a blue nosed dolphin. Uh, they all preserve the same spiral structure, but there are differences. You know, there are. The blue whale has a much larger cochlea than the guinea pig. The number of turns may change. The length may change. I should use this. So, um, and the name cochlea, of course, to a great person, rings bells, uh, because it relates to the ancient Greek word cochlos, which survives to uh, present-day Crete as cochleos, which means snail. And of course, what made an impression on me was the spiral shape and the name that uh, refers to the snail. And when I joined the Deafness Institute many years ago, I didn't know anything about hearing or the cochlea. The first thing that struck me was the spiral shape. I wondered why is the cochlea spiral? And more importantly, is there a functional significance to the spiral shape? Is there a reason why there is a spiral? And I told that my colleague, and he said, it's the reason why the cochlea is spiral is to uh, pack a long organ into a small space in the skull. The cochlea, if you unroll it, is about three and a half centimeters. And um, there were, um, I think, five or six previous researchers that had tried to study this, whether the spiral had a functional significance, and the conclusions were, well, they were inconclusive. They hadn't found anything concrete. And I thought it was worth revisiting as a question because there are more ways to pack a long organ into a small space. It doesn't have to be spiral. So let's see what sound is. You probably know it, but let's revisit it. Um, Sound requires a medium to travel through, unlike light, which can travel in void. Sound requires a medium, and in this, in, today it travels through air. And it is um, compressions and expansions of the molecules uh, that can be depicted in terms of their density as this wave uh, that vibrate from the source, uh, sound source to the ear. And uh, as always, uh, sound is characterized by its amplitude and what, by its wavelength. So the amplitude 
of the wave uh, relates to the sound intensity. In fact, intensity is the square of the um, amplitude. And sound intensity is measured in decibel. And if you're not familiar with the decibels, uh, I don't know if I'm talking now at 50 dB, uh, but uh, vacuum is supposed to be 80 dB, and a rock concert, depending on how loud they are in Greece, are pretty loud. It could be 120, 130 dB. And uh, sound is also characterized by wavelength or pitch. Pitch or sound frequency is how high or low the sound is. And um, uh, it is measured in hertz. Hertz is how many cycles we have in one second. And uh, humans can hear sound frequencies between 20 and 20,000 hertz. In fact, you hear probably up to 20,000 hertz. I've, in, through the years, I've lost some of my high frequencies. I probably hear only up to 15 or 16,000 hertz. But uh, the human voice ranges from 100 to uh, 6,000 hertz approximately, and the usable frequencies, the ones that are used for telephony, are between 300 and 3,500 hertz. Questions? Okay. So uh, the, uh, the voice frequencies are relatively low compared to the entire range. So let's go back to how sound is now processed by the ear. We saw that sound reaches a tympanic membrane and makes these three uh, bones oscillate. The last bone is called the stapes. The stapes vibrates against an opening in the cochlea called oval window, and then uh, the vibration is relayed inside the cochlea. Here you can see the cross section or the a section, it's not a cross section, of uh, the cochlea of a guinea pig. So here is the state, is the last bone of the three, and these empty spaces are not actually empty, they are filled with fluid. So up to, up to the stapes there is air, but from the stapes to inside the cochlea we have fluid. And uh, this thing that surrounds it is bone, Whereas here, I don't know if you can see the green line, uh, the green line is pointing uh, to this structure in uh, magnification. It is cells and gelatinous structures that are not bone, they can move inside the ear. Here, this, this structure is called organ of porting and it contains neurosensory cells. So when we uh, hear the vibration reaches this structure makes it vibrate, and the vibration is converted into neural signal in here, these uh, the cells that are here. So let's look again at a cross section of the cochlea. It is, you, you see that there are actually three fluid channels here, and they all together, they spiral around. And in humans, they have, they make three turns approximately. And the blue is bold, and the pink is those soft structures. And you, the pink is also depicted here. So this, this is where mechanical signal is converted to electrical signal. You can barely see it, I will show you in a minute. These are the neurosensory cells. This is the structure that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, but uh, the cells are sitting on a membrane that is called basal membrane. Okay, everything else is bone. The basal membrane is soft. The basal membrane can move inside the cochlea, and uh, its mechanical properties control the movement of the cochlea. The, the, the rest is soft structures. Okay, but what is notable? Oops, sorry, sorry. What is notable is. On top of these uh, neurosensory cells, the basal membrane would have been somewhere here. On top of the neurosensory, uh, on the, of the basal membrane, the structure are the neurosensory cells, and this here is the top surface of a neurosensory cell. So these are little hairs that are sticking out of the top surface. And when the basal membrane moves, everything moves. And these hairs move, and as these hairs are deflected, that's what makes the, neuro, the, the cells get stimulated. So the movement of these hair cells is what excites 
the neural cell. So here is a cross section again of the cordon of uh, cordy. The basilar membrane, which is soft and vibrates, is here. The, uh, with dark pink, you can see the uh, neurosensory hair cells, and the hair bundle that I showed earlier is here. Is here. So as the basilar membrane moves, the hairs move back and forth, and as they move, there are little openings, the, you know, little channels that open up, and ions, uh, potassium ions or uh, sodium ions, flow in and change the electrical. Uh, status of the cell and that leads to its excitation. So uh, here I have uncoiled the cochlea. You can see it from the side. And the black line here is the basilar membrane. And this is a schematic of how the basilar membrane vibrates in response to sound. The tympanic membrane vibrates. The vibration is transmitted via the three small bones and via the fluid, the fluid press it down to the membrane, which vibrates like that. And if you look at the basilar membrane from, uh, from a corner, this is what you would see. You see that the amplitude of the wave starts small, then it increases, and then it reaches a maximum place, and then it dies out. And you should think of the wave as follows. Imagine that we had um, secured a rope on the wall that is uh, across, okay? And I was holding the rope tight and I give it a jolt like that. You would see a wave that travels down the uh, rope. This is the, the, um, the picture that you should have in your head to what is happening in the basilar membrane. With one difference, if I do this to the rope, the mechanical properties of the rope are the same throughout and the wave is going to travel all the way to the end. In the basilar membrane, something peculiar happens. It is very narrow and stiff at the beginning, so this place here is right here. And as we move down towards the end, it becomes wider and softer. So it changes mechanical properties uh, along its length. And this makes it, uh, I would say it's a miracle. It's, uh, it works like a Fourier analysis. Why? If we have, okay, so here, you, the basilar membrane is depicted by a dark gray color. You can barely see it. You can see it better here. You see this dark line that goes next to the orange line and it becomes wider and wider as you spiral all the way to the end. Okay, I'll, I prefer to see my finger. This is the uh, basilar membrane. So you see that here it is very narrow and it is stiff. Here it is wide and soft. So, if a high frequency sound comes in, and here I'm assuming high frequencies are about 1500 hertz, uh, then it is going, the, the wave is going to reach its maximal amplitude where the basilar membrane is narrow and stiff. And if a medium frequency wave comes in, then its maximum amplitude is going to uh, reach a location here. And if a deep sound, a low frequency sound comes in, it's going to travel all the way to the end. And an analogy that you could think of is the, um, assume that you have an ARP sitting inside a room. An ARP has a short, long, and longer, um, um, what do you call them? Strings. Strings. Okay, if a high pitch sound comes in, it's going to make the short, stiff uh, strings resonate. If a low frequency sound comes in, it's going to make uh, the uh, long and softer strings resonate. Okay, and something equivalent is happening here. Um, not exactly correct, but it gives you a sense that the different mechanical properties result to the wave reaching its maximum amplitude at a different location. So, um, in every location along the uh, basilar membrane corresponds to a uh, sound of a particular frequency. So, if a 2000 Hz comes inside the ear, the, here is where the maximal frequency is going to be of the, of the wave. And the neurosensory cells that are sitting here, these, it's only those cells that are going to get excited and send a signal to the brain. 
So the, if the cells that are sitting on the 3000 Hz point are excited, they know, oops, a 3000 Hz sound has entered the ear. And this way, this is the way that the cochlea, through the changing mechanical properties of the basilar membrane, can decompose a sound into its component frequencies. And that's why we say that it acts like a Fourier analyzer. Any questions? So, um, just an aside, uh, many of us have, have been to uh, area, re, locations where the sound has been very, very loud. For example, during Easter you may have uh, fireworks, or if you go to a concert and you sit next to the speakers, it's going to be very loud. All this in intensity is going to reach the high frequency region first. And that's why most of us start by losing our high frequencies. And um, yeah, by the time you reach, I don't know, uh, 60 years, you basically have lost this first segment of uh, your hearing capability. Of course, there are other people that for different uh, regions, like pathologists, they can lose their low frequencies. Much of the work, uh, much of what we know about the ear was work done by a Hungarian born ear from Bekesi, who then moved to Stockholm and then to the United States. But his work on how the ear functions won him the Nobel Prize for Physiology in 1961. And he also addressed the question of you know, whether the spiral shape affects hearing in any way. And he established that coiling is not essential for hearing. Uh, for example, this is, the, this is a mammal, it's a spiny arm eater, uh, and it doesn't have a spiral cochlea, its cochlea is bent, but it can still hear. And he also suggested that by having a spiral shape, you can concentrate the blood and nerve supplies in the center of the cochlea. Uh, a few decades later, another scientist, which was Christopher West, uh, decided oops, to study, this is the same, uh, the correlation, try to see if there was a correlation between geometry, geometrical parameters and the low frequency limit of hearing. And so what he did is, is he recorded how, how low a mouse can hear at 60 dB. A mouse can hear um, about 900 hertz at 60 dB. A rat can hear mm, 300 hertz. Man can hear um, 20 dB at 60 hertz, and and the horizontal line is the number. Huh? The horizontal line is number of uh, spiral turns and basilar membrane length. So he tried different plots. He tried the horizontal axis of the length of the basilar membrane or number of spiral turns. For some reason, this product seemed to give a good correlation, but we don't know why. You don't understand why this was at all significant. Anyway, and that's where I, I mean, I and my colleagues come in. We tried again to build a mathematical model. And uh, of course we wanted to retain the spiral uh, geometry. So we tried different uh, coordinate systems. We tried a, co a toroidal coordinate system and a helical coordinate system and an in-plane spiral. And my colleague uh, Richard Chadwick he even uh, had uh, spirals carved into an acrylic and they, he filled them with water and tried to see does water move differently in a spiral channel. Didn't get too far with that project. Uh, and this is a picture of me and my colleague who is here like 20 years ago uh, presenting our work for the first time in a scientific conference. Here we examined in detail all the different geometrical characteristics and we were able to establish that it would suffice to look at the mechanics in an in-plane spiral. So from now on I'm going to ignore the 3D out of plane spiral and we are going to look at the in-plane spiral. So this is more or less the you know, mathematical simplification of the cochlea. This is, this is our cochlea. We have ignored uh, the neurosensory cells. We have ignored all the supporting structures. The only thing that we have retained is the basilar membrane and its change with chemical properties. Um, so you can, the yellow here is the basilar membrane and you see how it starts narrow and increases in width from the base to the apex. 
So uh, this is the geometrical model, spiral uh, coordinates. And the reason why I'm showing this slide is that uh, this variable, R sub m, is really the variable that is going to become important later, which uh, measures the radius of curvature, the distance of the midline of the basal membrane, the dotted line is the midline, uh, to the spiral center. And um, there were many people before us that had studied the uh, cochlea. And uh, don't fret about the equations. I know that not all of you have uh, seen uh, uh, differential equations, let alone partial differential equations. I just wanted to let you know that uh, we assume that fluid mass is conserved. So inside the cochlea, no fluid is lost. And fluid momentum is also conserved inside the cochlea. Uh, with the boundary condition, you might be a bit more familiar. We assume that no fluid go, flows through the uh, bony walls. And Newton's second law holds on the basilar membrane. We saw that the basilar membrane moves. So eta is another variable that you should remember. Eta is how far the basilar membrane has moved from the point of rest. Okay, so when it moves up, it moves by eta. And eta is a function of radius, of how far we have traveled. Theta is the variable that measures how far along the spiral. Um, and so if eta, eta has units of distance, so the first derivative of eta measures what? What, are, what is the, tell me, the spin. And the second derivative of eta with respect to time? It's acceleration. So here we have mass times acceleration. And that's why I'm saying this is Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that mass times acceleration is the sum of the forces that are acting on the membrane. And which are the forces that are acting on the membrane? We have pressure from, um, from the top and the bottom fluid channels. We have, this is viscosity, it's a dam viscous damping. Uh, proportional to velocity of the basilar membrane, and here, uh, kappa times eta, you might have seen it in physics. We assume that the basilar membrane is elastic. So if we displace it from the point of rest, the, it, uh, there will be an elastic recoil force like, much like uh, springs. Remember, uh, Hooke's constant, if you, this is what I have, K is hook, uh, kappa is Hooke's constant. So if I displace the basilar membrane by eta, the restoring force is going to be proportional to the displacement. And kappa is going to be the host constant. And we also assume that fluid and basilar membrane uh, velocities at the interface match. Okay. There is a lot of analysis that comes after these equations. I'm not going to show you the analysis. Uh, I thought it would be more important to show you the results just to give you a sense of what uh, we were able to establish. Um, I said M is membrane mass, B this was damping, kappa is the stiffness, the Hooke's constant. And we also assume that the wave energy as it propagates down the spiral remains constant. Uh, but I'm going to show that the spiral shape can redistribute the energy inside the, the spiral. And this is dark gray, it could be thought of as the energy density that is redistributed. But let's not talk about energy now. I want you to, um, I want to tell you about the whispering gallery. What is a whispering gallery? Um, you can find a whispering gallery, and this is going to be an analogy for what we're talking about, about the cochlea. Uh, there is a whispering gallery also in front of uh, the Mihok buildings. You have a whispering gallery whenever you have a curved wall. So in front of Mihok, you have a wall that is made of bricks, have you seen the wall that is in front of me? Hope that is made of bricks. It's kind of curved. I can't think of any other curved uh, walls that are in either me hope or anywhere in the. Uh, is there anyone from uh, the School of Architecture here? No, they could be uh, perhaps tell us. Okay, so the Whispering Gallery is a balcony on this place of uh, the Saint Paul's Cathedral. Is the main cathedral in London, and this is a cross-section of the cathedral. So this is the dome, and the Whispering Gallery, which is a, a balcony, is here. 
that this is what the gallery looks like. The diameter is 32 meters. And what is, it is known for and where it gets its name from is this. I don't know if you can see it because it's a fairly dark picture. Uh, the, the picture shows uh, five boys that have placed their ear against the wall. So what happens here is that if someone uh, is sitting on the other side of the gallery, 32 meters away, because that's the diameter, and whispers against the wall, the whispers cling, sorry, cling to the wall and travel without losing much intensity all around the wall and can be heard on the other side. So 32 meters is a huge distance to travel, but the concave shape is what uh, makes the sound, you know, retain its intensity as it travels around. And this picture was taken during the Second World War. The boys were close from that time, and they are obviously listening to someone. And I here the wall is very smooth, so it is very easy for sound to propagate. But even if you try it on the concave wall of Mikhop, which is full of bricks, it still works. So you can try it sometimes. And um, Lord Rayleigh and Sir Harry were trying to explain how sound was propagating. And if I remember well, Sir Harry was saying that sound propagates across the roof, whereas Ro Lord Rayleigh was saying that sound travels around, uh, around the walls. Lord Rayleigh was uh, closer to what was actually happening, but they both assumed the first principle that sound travels in a straight line and then is reflected using Schnell laws, Schnell's law when it meets um, you know, a, solid, a solid object like the roof. This is another whispering gallery uh, under Foucault's pendulum in the Pantheon in, uh, in uh, Paris. And the picture was taken by my colleague's wife. But the reason I have these two pictures together is because here the Whispering Gallery looks very much like the inside of the cochlea. So this is a picture taken by a miniature camera that was put inside the cochlea by medical doctors that wanted to place cochlear implants inside the cochlea. So you see that you know, there is a resemblance between the two and you can certainly think of the spiral channel of the cochlea as being a Whispering Gallery. So uh, my colleague Emilius Dimitriadis assumed that wave energy travels like sound in straight lines and is reflected. So what he did, this looks like a, a gray solid line, but if you look at it close up, like here, it is actually 100 lines, 100 rays that he allowed to propagate straight up. And each time they paint the outside wall, they get reflected. So they, the rays are reflected here and here. And after a certain number of reflections, the rays are concentrated on the outside wall. So this is a close-up of the rays. If, if I take the square and blow it up, that's what all the lines look like. And it appears as if they have all concentrated on the outside wall of the spiral channel. And this is an indication, an analogy to how the energy focuses on the outside wall. So this was an example showing how the spiral shape can focus energy, which is something that was not uh, known or appreciated before. And why is this focusing important? Well, if you have a greater energy density here than here, then you're going to change the way the cochlea moves. Here I'm assuming a straight cochlea, so you know, the energy density is uniform and the vibration is uniform underneath the uh, membrane. Here I'm assuming that the basilar membrane moves a lot more here than here, and this may, provides a rocking motion to the structures of the membrane. And this rocking motion changes the way that the hair, sensory hair cells and the bundles move against the, the remaining structures, and they could shear the hair bundles a lot more. They could stimulate the neurosensory cells a lot more than this, this type of movement. Okay, so here we assume that uh, the spiral shape is important for enhancing uh, the motion and the shearing uh, of the uh, neurosensory cells. 
So, uh, in, in contrast to the previous models where we assumed that the displacement of the basilar membrane was uniform across the channel, uh, we uh, looked at how this vibration amplitude changes across the cross section of the basilar membrane. So, what I've done here is I've taken the, my square box spiral model, cut it. Uh, and looked at a cross section, and I looked at how much, and I'm recording how much it vibrates on the outside wall and how much it vibrates on the inside wall. And by looking at the difference between the vibration on the outside wall and the inside wall, I can see whether the basilar membrane tilts, whether this uneven distribution of density creates this tilt. Okay, so I measure the tilt by looking at the difference between the amplitude on the outside and the inside, and by comparing it to the straight model, we see that the tilt is proportional to the wave number of the wave, the width, and the radius of curvature. This is the radius of curvature of the basilar membrane midline, which I showed you in the beginning of the, in the geometric <coughs> model. So, um, and what we did is the following. We looked at this ratio at the beginning of the spiral, and we looked at the ratio at the end of the spiral, and we divided the two properties. So delta eta is really this difference. Okay, and we see that the, the ratio of the tilt at the apex to the tilt at the base is inversely proportional to the ratio of the radii. Let's see it with an example. These are two different spirals. And this spiral has a very big radii, a ratio, a very big radius in the beginning at the base, and a very small radius at the apex. So the radius, the radius at the base is ten times bigger than the radius at the apex. Um, whereas this spiral, you know, changes a lot slower its curvature. And this geometrical difference is going to have an effect of how much the basilar membrane tilts. So, because of this um, um, relation that we established, uh, we could say that the tilt of the basilar membrane, how much it rocks, it's much bigger for this type of spiral than it is for this type of spiral. Okay. So, it is beneficial to have a spiral that starts out with a big ratio and then tightly spirals in. And in humans and in whales, it, uh, the, radius, <coughs> the radius at the base is in fact 10 times bigger than the radius at the apex, and this provides an amplification of 20 dB. And uh, my colleague Emilio has run his ray tracing algorithms where he looked at how much the, the rays are focused in different geometries, and you see again in this spiral, whose radius doesn't change very much, the focusing is not as good as the focusing that this um, spiral provides. Um, I, I guess this was big news by in the scientific community because you know there were people who were trying to figure out what was happening in the spiral for decades, and then. You know, finally, we came up with an answer, so that gave us some time talking with um, um, journalists. But uh, you know, the theoretical result for us was not sufficient because we wanted to see whether we can test. It was a theoretical result, but we didn't have a way to test it, and the cochlea is in the bone. So in order to test it, one would have to, I don't know, take away the bone. This is not possible. So instead, we did the following. Uh, we traced the spiral for many different mammals. And you know, by looking at the <coughs> radius of curvature at the base and the radius of curvature at the apex, we were able to calculate this ratio of radii for different mammals. Um, the radii ratio for mouse is 1.6. For hardware purposes, it is 2.5. For the rat, it's 3. For the dolphins, it is 3. No, 4.2. The sperm whale has a radial ratio of 5. Cat is 6. 
guinea pig is 7.8, man is, oh, man is 8.1. Um, I think this is elephant and cow, E is for elephant and C is for cow. And H is the humpback whale. So the humpback whale has the biggest radii ratio. And this is the low frequency limit of hearing at 60 dB. How well the animals could hear um, what frequency, uh, down to what frequency an animal could hear at 60 dB. So at 60 dB, the mouse can only listen at down to uh, 900 hertz. The rat can hear to 400. The cat at 50 or say 60, etc. And all mammals felt nicely in the same curve, which was really nice. Um, ah, these are the examples of the spirals in humpback whales and, uh, and dolphins that were traced to us by Darlene Ketten. Darlene Ketten is a scientist that works for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, you know, close to Boston. So she, she, ah, this is an interesting story. Her expertise is the hearing of uh, dolphins and whales. And the uh, US Navy has sought her advice because they carry out underwater uh, explosions. And they want her advice as to where to have explosions so that the animals are not disturbed. Okay? We don't have that in this. Uh, or anywhere in the Mediterranean for all right now. Okay, so here is once more the same data, but uh, the, the vertical plot is a semi-log plot, and you see um, that all the data fall nicely on a straight, almost straight line. Uh, the different colors are because the reviewers, when we publish our work, ask us you know, to explain how we got the low frequency limit of hearing and the yellow da data are nerve data, like they asked us to see if there were scientists that were actually trying to see which of the nerves are receiving signal uh, when the sound comes in. Uh, but it is at the end of this work that Wired Magazine published a short story about our work and use this title. Better that skip the subwoofer, hack the hearing. No, you cannot hack the hearing. But um, our results are now used by paleontologists who um, want to understand what sounds uh, different animals hear, especially animals that are extinct. Because the cochlea is embedded in bone, the, maybe the cells dissolve over the centuries, but the spiral retains in the, in the skull. So the paleontologists can trace the spiral and the geometry of the spiral, and they can calculate the ratio of radii, and thus infer whether the animal was able to hear low frequencies or not. And these are two papers that were um, that do this work. I want to see what time it is. It is 2.12. Um, so I guess I should summarize and not talk about the rest of the work that I've done. Um, so spirals, we were able to say, um, establish that spirals uh, with a large decrease in radius of curvature and use a, a larger basilar membrane tilt and they redistribute the energy, usually a whispering gallery effect, and the tilt amplification due to curvature could be up to 20 decibels. And large basilar membrane tilt may amplify low frequencies, and we found a good correlation between, basilar, between the radial ratio and low frequency limit of hearing in land and sea mammals. The collaborators for the theoretical part of the work were Richard Chadwin, Emilia Zimitriadis, and myself, whereas Aline Ketten and her Postdocs, Julia Luna and Jen O'Malley helped in um, tracing the spirals in, ma in sea mammals. And when we published our work, someone sent me this picture. He was